our next panel is led by um, Tony Kovchek, uh, professor at Stanford University. And uh, the topic will be resource extraction industries. We're going into the uh, specific um, industries now. And I'll turn it over to Tony to introduce the panel and get things started. Thank you. Tony, it's all yours. Great, thanks. You know, I have, uh, oops. Uh, I have one slide just maybe to show in terms of context. It'll take a minute then we'll get going here. So uh, just a, a, a figure that appeared uh, recently in the Houston Chronicle, uh, just to set the stage uh, a little bit for uh, at least oil and gas, uh, looking at really the different uh, CO2 intensity of oil production around the globe from the top uh, producers. Uh, along with, you know, with uh, size of production, right? So um, upstream is, uh, you know, a significant contributor to the total, you know, carbon footprint of transportation fuels and um, something that we'll get into a little bit today. So with that, um, we'll get right into our panelists. Our first uh, panelist is Bob Fogelsong, who has over 20 years of experience in upstream technology with ExxonMobil. Uh, He's currently the upstream uh, GHG solutions manager, and he's now part of the recently formed Exxon Mobil technology and engineering company, where his uh, current role focuses on technology solutions for meeting uh, Exxon Mobil's uh, objectives in uh, greenhouse gas uh, reductions. So Bob, I um, invite you to take it away. Oh, thank you very much for the introduction, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, it's a, a, a great opportunity to, to talk about how ExxonMobil upstream is engaging in the, the energy transition and, and, uh, and talk about some of the challenges and, and opportunities associated with, with the decarbonization of our, of our uh, oil and gas uh, producing assets. So I, I wanted to, to start out with um, a, a slide. I just have a few slides to show um, if my screen will advance. There we go. Um, th these are a couple of graphs that were, were taken from our Advancing Climate Solutions publication that, that came out earlier this year, and, and BJ alluded to this earlier. And I just wanted to share these, provide a bit of perspective on you know, how oil and gas production is, is likely to fit into you know, a, a range of uncertainty about the energy transition uh, in the coming decades. And so, so these graphs show um, several of the, the main um, energy transition scenarios that I think we're all familiar with. The IEA step scenario, state energy policy scenario, which obviously um, is, is far from where we need to be. Um, an average representation of the, the IPCC lower two degree scenarios, kind of showing the demand out in 2050. And then the, the, the light blue line there is the IEA net zero scenario. And, and you know, I wanted to show this for a couple of reasons. First, obviously, there's that huge range of uncertainty. Um, but uh, even in the, the, the net zero scenario there, uh, oil and gas remains critical to meeting um, the demands of, of society. And, and so, you know, as you, as you look out to the future um, with the, the oil and gas decline that, that, that's typical of the industry, um, five to 7% um, between 7% uh, for oil, 5% for gas, uh, even in that net zero scenario, there's still massive oil and gas investment required. And, and the IEA estimates that at uh, over $10 trillion between now and 2050. So there, there's still a lot of work to be done in the oil and gas industry here. And, and that really highlights the, the decarbonization um, challenge and, and opportunity to meet society's needs for us. But it also, it also highlights uh, you know, a couple of different problems. And between that light blue and the dark blue, Clearly, the dark blue, that, that new production to, to fill the, the decline gap, you know, there that, that will be those will be big new greenfield projects, opportunities to apply emerging technologies and things. But but the, the light blue is is still very critical, but that the decarbonization of the brownfield, and that carries, you know, obviously some some unique challenges. And that's that's the kind of the way we approach thinking about our business uh, as we go forward. That there are those two distinct um, opportunities, which even for very similar types of assets may have very different solutions. And it's important to keep that range of technology options open. So my next slide, I, this is just a, a, a map of, of where ExxonMobil operates around the world. And 
uh, or a couple cases of, of active development areas for, for future operations. And I'm, I don't want to show this for you know, how big Exxon is and how spread out we are, but it's a hugely geographically diverse industry. Uh, there are oil and gas production around the world. And, and as you can imagine, looking at that range of countries, there's, there's very different levels of infrastructure and policy support to, to assist with decarbonization. And, and so I, I just uh, throwing up three examples of, of kind of the, the diversity of our business. So, so on the left, we have um, our, our unconventional business. So, so this is shale oil, um, like, like in the Permian out in West Texas and New Mexico. And, and, and of course, out there, there's, there's infrastructure available where, where we can, we can uh, tap into the, the electrical grid and, and, uh, and, and purchase remote, renewable power to help um, sustainably um, produce those, those assets. But then on the other side of the world, um, you look at PNG, where we have a, a, a um, very significant LNG facility. You know, out there, the, these assets are so remote that we had to build our own landing strip to, to bring in our oil and gas facilities. And, and, and so obviously, again, very different decarbonization technologies required um, between those. And, and, and then even more challenging, the one in the center, um, Guyana, deep water, you know, these these floating production storage and offloading vessels FPSOs the, these are, can be hundreds of kilometers offshore, um, which obviously creates a, a great challenge uh, in terms of um, you know accessing any any sort of onshore infrastructure is very difficult, um, very challenging, and of course your your space and weight constraints on those producing vessels um, are, make it make it very challenging uh, to to uh, to decarbonize, particularly in the brownfield. And, and, and all of these resources are necessary to, to meet that oil and gas demand in the future. So, so it does just represent that, that broad range of, of, uh, of uh, needs for the oil and gas extraction business. And, and, but, but ultimately, that's, that's the challenge that, that we have to take on, that you know, Exxon's taking on. We're, we're committed um, to being a, a, a leader in the oil and gas um, energy transition. And um, plan to reduce our, our scope one and two upstream GHG intensity by 40 to 50 percent uh, by 2030 relative to 2016. And, uh, and, and as, uh, as VJ uh, mentioned earlier, we, we have a corporate ambition to be net zero by, by 2050. And we're in the process of building roadmaps for all of our assets um, to, to, um, to plan uh, to figure out how to do that. And, and then uh, going back to that Permian asset, um, which is just really critical of Exxon's future growth in the upstream and, and as well as our, um, our domestic energy security, as we're, we're seeing recently, um, you know, we've committed being net, net zero there by 2030, uh, an even greater challenge and um, are, are well underway, those, those planning efforts. And, and so that's where I wanted to wrap up is um, this uh, another um, set of graphs taken from that, um, that Advancing Climate Solutions report. Uh, th this shows some of the, the potential abatement options for reaching that net zero 2030 goal for the Permian. And, uh, and, and when I mentioned earlier that, that different assets have, have different challenges, at a very high level, the, 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 the challenges are very similar. There, there are three primary drivers of GHG emissions in the upstream. And those are, those are methane, um, flaring, and energy. And, and so, so methane comes from both combustion slip um, methane that doesn't get burned in a gas engine or a flare, for example, and then of course fugitive emissions. Uh, these are natural gas um, uh, pneumatic bleed devices or or uh, or fugitive emissions from uh, from tank vapors, for example. And, and there, it's really critical to get better um, better measurement uh, of uh, of those emissions. And and we're in, involved in a number of efforts, uh, technology collaborations to better understand those emissions, so we can ultimately address those and abate those. And one of them is Project Astra, ground-based uh, methane detection system that we're we're piloting here recently in in uh, in the Permian Basin, as well as a, a collaboration with Scepter Air, which is a kind of integrating across ground-based aerial and satellite monitoring to provide a a really comprehensive kind of real-time quantitative uh, measure of methanes. And, and, and to, just to underscore that commitment to, to reducing those methane emissions and, and ultimately working towards eliminating those, we've um, recently joined the, the Aiming for Zero Methane Emissions Initiative that uh, was just announced by the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, OGCI. Um, tur turning to flaring, uh, there the, the, uh, the, the orange bar, um, there are our goal uh, is to eliminate all of our routine, routine flaring 
and, and we're working towards um, uh, an objective of, of, uh, of, of eliminating that by 2030, consistent with the, uh, the World Bank uh, zero routine flaring initiative. And, uh, and then with, uh, again, going to the Permian, we have an even more ambitious goal there um, to, to eliminate routine flaring by 2022. So we're, we're taking that challenge very seriously. Um, it, that doesn't eliminate it completely. There's still safety flaring that will take place. And that's where you know, some, of these, uh, some of these really difficult areas, you see that, that small blue bar there on, on that road, mar road map, that does represent some, some offsets or negative carbon technologies that may help with that. But then the, the biggest source of emission there in the green is um, it represents the, the energy demand of our own industry. And, and that can be you know, gas turbines or diesel engines, electric motors, driving compressors, pumps, uh, electrical generation, process heat. And, and, and that, that obviously requires a, a broad range of, of solutions that, that we're exploring, um, ranging from electrification um, with, with low carbon power, not necessarily green, but, but you can do uh, obviously power generation with, um, with CCS. Uh, carbon capture sequestration um, and uh, and fuel switching, uh, whether it's hydrogen or re renewable um, hydrocarbon fuels, all of those will will play into this decarbonization um, strategy for uh, for our upstream uh, upstream oil and gas industry. And and which solution ultimately gets applied is is going to depend on some advances in technology. Um, certainly, policy will will drive some of those decisions, but. Um, but ultimately, that's that's uh, just part of the challenge of um, uh, the, the the opportunity for our industry. You know, we're really building up a, a really deep understanding of our of our opportunity space, and and gives us confidence to meeting those 2030 plans and ultimately our our 2050 ambition. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Bob. So we'll let all of our panelists make a presentation, then we'll turn to the Q and A. So I want to. Move on to uh, Sarah Gazda, who is the research director and chief scientist in computational geosciences at Norse, uh, which is an independent research institute in uh, Bergen, Norway. Uh, there, she currently leads the Center for Sustainable Subsurface Resources, a national research center that's going to provide uh, the knowledge required for the Norwegian petroleum industry to transition to zero emissions uh, production and clean energy resources in the coming decades. So thanks, Sarah. I think, Bob, you need to stop sharing. <laughs> Arsene, can you hear me? Yes. So, yeah, good. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. It's uh, I live in Norway, so it's still light out, even uh, getting late into the evening. So we look forward to, uh, to the summer. So, but uh, let me see if I can get my... Um, right thing up do you see something it's good yeah i'll put it in the screen presentation mode good yeah thanks for having me uh i uh, i think i was charged with the task of bringing a bit of the european norwegian perspective uh and as um as tony said i'm i'm currently leading a, a new center uh, which is really dedicated toward de decarbonizing uh the petroleum sector from from the from the role and the, and the perspective of the subsurface um, so I, I'd like to, to, to bring up a couple points uh, as a kind of background to a lot of the research that we're really getting into. And, and the first one is, and I think Bob really showed it <laughs> quite well, is that we know that oil, and especially gas uh, for, for Europe, uh, is going to, to play a really important role uh, in the energy transition. And this was clearly something that we, we knew for a long time. Uh, but if I gave this talk five weeks ago, I would just stop here and move on. But with the uh, current uh, geopolitical situation in, in Ukraine, uh, and we're getting news every day about how um, we really want to accelerate um, the um, independence from Russia, oil and gas. And that's where Norway, uh, which right now, <laughs> I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, uh, will we'll really be um, expected to increase uh, oil and gas production to meet the, the gap uh, that is left by the 40% um, that is currently uh, provided by, by Russia. So it's a really interesting time uh, here uh, where, where, um, where exploration, which of course is still a big political uh, football of whether or not we will continue to explore for oil and gas in Norway, uh, and I think all of these arguments are, are going back up in the air. Um, at the same time, right, is the 
I think Tony showed it, right? Norway is one of the lowest uh, in the world in uh, carbon intensity from the oil and gas from the upstream, upstream side. Uh, but we want to do more. Uh, every single operator, and I'm sitting here today in Stavanger, which is uh, the oil and gas capital of Norway, which is not as big as Houston uh, by any means, <laughs> but uh, where every single operator gets up and says, we will be uh, carbon neutral uh, by 2030 and have zero emissions production by 2050. Every single operator uh, I, I've heard uh, in the past uh, months has that in, as an ambition. This is a huge challenge. Uh, not only, again, if I gave this talk six months ago, it, oh yes, we just electrify and we, we move on because Norway has abundant hydropower. But again, uh, even before the war, the energy uh, crisis and supply uh, driven uh, energy price increase really changed that discussion, uh, both nationally and also in, in the EU and, and certainly uh, around the world. So how we're going to do this, of course, is uh, uh, on the agenda, has been on the agenda. Uh, and of course, Norway uh, has said now that 50% of its fields will be uh, running on electric energy uh, within the next uh, decade. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, things that need to happen. Uh, it's coming quick and fast. At the same time, is this transition to the future value streams? Uh, and I can't actually see my, uh, I need to minimize this. Uh, with this idea that we're going to reuse uh, as much of the depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs out there, in addition to exploring for new, uh, what they call sustainable resources, and the sustainable resource base to storage. Uh, Norway, of course, has now um, the world's largest uh, climate project, or at least Norway's largest climate project, with the long ship, which will capture uh, CO2 emissions from a cement factory, and now pretty soon to be a waste incineration facility in Oslo, and ship it out to offshore Bergen uh, with the idea of really providing a CO2 um, storage, transport and storage hub uh, for a, a lot of Northern Europe. And there's a lot of discussions going on right now about how to upscale, how to bring uh, CO2 storage deployment up uh, to, to, the next, uh, to the next level, which we're talking an, a scale up of 10 to 100 times. So there's a lot going on all at once. It's a really exciting time. Uh, and I think the big, the big challenge for us from, uh, from the research side uh, is knowing that, that, first of all, when you look at the complexity of the decisions that are being made, uh, and I think everybody knows that there's no silver bullet. Uh, and we go back to electricity, uh, electrification discussion, you know, that uh, just expecting that we can draw power from land, uh, especially with the current uh, energy uh, situation, will not be um, the status quo. We'll have to really think about a lot of creative, innovative ways to get us uh, to these ambitions of 2030, 2050. And I'll just remind everybody in this room that Norway being a, a renewable energy producing land with hydropower, offshore emissions from oil and gas upstream, uh, it constitutes 28% of Norway's um, domestic emissions. So part of Norway's goal to meet its Paris Agreement <laughs> commitments uh, taking uh, the oil and gas emissions down to net zero by 2050 is also an important part of Norway's political um, climate ambitions. <laughs> it's a lot of it wrapped up in uh, one big package. So, so we know that it, to, to meet all this, it really requires a tremendous amount of uh, innovation, creativity. We have to put research on the table everywhere we can uh, to really uh, get us uh, to these um, energy uh, availability, zero emissions, and, and the green shift altogether. So uh, from, from the research side, uh, we're looking at this from the subsurface. There's a lot going on on the top side uh, in terms of uh, floating offshore wind and, and you know, attaching solar cells and doing carbon capture and storage, uh, carbon capture, let's say, all based on the platform. Uh, looking at everything uh, from that. And what we're looking at is really from the subsurface side. Um, I mentioned the, the center. And there's four different uh, particular focus. One is about the reservoir operations themselves. Right now, reservoir operations have been run on the idea that we have stable, relatively cheap power uh, provided by the platform gas turbines uh, available at the ready. Uh, if you switch to electrification, if you switch to a, uh, offshore wind, if you switch to a more, let's say, energy uh, cost uh, variability, we might need to really think about how we can look at the reservoir operations and try to synchronize them with the idea that you have intermittent 
uh, energy availability. This is a really interesting, from the scientific point of view, a lot of very cool stuff to look at, but it really could have a, a, a lot of opportunities here to uh, take a new look at how we operate reservoirs uh, and, and get away, or at least in some cases, and, and I think Bob showed that you have so many different types of fields out there. In some cases, there may be an opportunity here to throttle production to match, uh, to a certain extent, the, the energy availability or energy price. Uh, all, you can't always do that. Uh, or in some cases, uh, you may want to diversify your energy supply. And here uh, also, there's a, an opportunity here to, again, uh, from the platform point of view, have a bit of energy independence. And if you're running a platform off offshore wind, you would like to look at other ways of energy storage, uh, not just uh, shipping out a bunch of batteries to be, to be attached to the platform, but looking at how we can maybe use hydrogen, uh, compressed air, geothermal, and other ways of utilizing the subsurface to sort of supplement that uh, and to stabilize that variability. Uh, I think, and also we need to look at how digital workflows that we have. So from everything from data simulation, optimization, reservoir simulation, you know, the demands of electrification and the variability of energy availability uh, uh, the, you have different uh, things going on in the subsurface. If you have hydrogen storage, CO2 storage, uh, CO2 EOR, regular water drives uh, to maintain an efficient workflow, uh, but still maintain physical understanding, uh, these really, uh, this is an ongoing challenge in the industry. And I think with the electrification, it adds extra pressure to really um, accelerate and, and innovate in, in those uh, workflows. And of course, the last, it's really about uh, leveraging knowledge. Uh, if you're running a field uh, or a portfolio of fields and you want to think about their long-term long -term business plans, uh, uh, you wanna really start thinking about that now and maybe even how you operate reservoirs has, a, has an impact on what could possibly be their later use uh, in, in, the, in the zero emissions uh, perspective, everything from hydrogen, uh, energy storage or, or carbon storage. So we use this term upcycling and upcycling, it's actually a bit of a strange concept in Europe, uh, but it's quite common in, in the US of you take something old and you make it into something new with a lot of creativity and innovation. And, uh, and I think that's really where we, where we really need to be thinking is how we take this uh, classic paradigm of uh, petroleum reservoir and petroleum reservoir operations uh, and think about the, the, uh, an integrated uh, view of we, we operate for today and we operate for MPV and we try and optimize on, on that present value, but we should be <laughs> trying to gain as much information out of that reservoir to help us uh, turn that reservoir into something uh, in, in the future. So that's really a lot of very interesting research and, and tools and development of uh, screening criteria and, and, and various other aspects that uh, in a way, uh, we need to take a lot of knowledge that's built up in, in carbon storage and, uh, and try and uh, you know, use centers like these as a, as a clearinghouse for that type of information to you know, filter out what's really needed uh, moving forward. So I'll just uh, finish with this slide. You know, I think, uh, as I said at the beginning, I mean, there's so much complexity and then decisions that are being made today, uh, tomorrow, and, and, uh, and research from the subsurface side really wants to look at, you know, what kind of added value can we obtain from different ways and new operational strategies that can help, uh, let's say, and I think both of these sentences say the same thing, you know, add some granularity to the subsurface component when you're looking at electrification scenarios, when you're looking at the total best energy solution for individual fields or portfolio fields and what to do with them later. And so for industry point of view, you know, they look at a research center, well, will this work for my field? <laughs> uh, what are you going to do for me? And, uh, and so we're really, of course, focused, uh, although we like to play in the lab and with our numerical tools and, and such forth, you know, we have always in the back of our mind of really producing um, tools and, and knowledge and, and, uh, and uh, various other, um, uh, I think, tangible things that, uh, that industry can take. Uh, with them uh, in, in, into this, uh, these new challenges that we're facing. Uh, so, uh, so with that, I'll just uh, thank, uh, thank you for uh, having this chance and, uh, and also uh, acknowledge uh, the partners in the center, Stanford, one of those, uh, and, uh, and our funding partners. So thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Sarah.
So we'll, uh, we'll turn now to Adam Brandt, and I'll just again introduce him briefly. He's a professor in uh, energy resources engineering here at Stanford. Uh, his work is focused on understanding, measuring, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions from uh, fossil uh, energy sources. And the main tools that he uses are life cycle assessment and uh, process optimization to estimate uh, impacts of technologies at, at scale. So thanks, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Can you guys see my slides? It's good. All right, thanks. Yeah, so happy to um, happy to talk and a couple of good talks to follow. A lot of a lot of questions I want to ask. Um, I'm going to talk about our efforts towards um, sort of part of our uh, oil and gas um, greenhouse gas work, which is around developing tools to estimate um, consistently emissions from oil and gas operations. Uh, this is distinct from our work, mostly distinct from our work on methane, uh, which I won't touch on too much. Um, so I think there's a, lot, a set of you know pretty big questions that are still out there in the open um, that we're beginning to get a better handle on, but I think are, are still, um, you know, we face a higher level of uncertainty than we like. You know, first, um, how large, well, how large are, how large are our greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the global oil and gas supply chain? All right, so just, you know, what, what's the number? If we could come up with a number, um, what is it? How did you compute it? How do you define it? Um, and that's, you know, that relates to the second point. What are the uncertainties uh, in these emissions estimates? And third, and this is a really important practical point for this um, sort of stage in history, I guess, is how can, um, you know, sort of reporting and monitoring, whether, you know, sort of government mandated or through voluntary means, uh, help improve practices and, and sort of industry accountability? And these are all, you know, kind of important open uh, I would say big questions. We've been working mostly towards the first and second um, with the model that we call the OPG model. Um, and um, really the goal of the OPG model is to build an estimator that leverages petroleum engineering uh, you know, fundamentals to estimate what the expected emissions would be from an oil and gas project based on its underlying properties, such as depth, pressure, API, gravity, water cut, et cetera. Um, OPTI stands for the Oil Production Greenhouse Gas Emissions Estimator. Uh, and I, I have often said that an alternative title for the model uh, that was suggested by a buddy of mine was OPEC, the Oil Production Emissions Calculator. Uh, that was a little too on the nose for, uh, for one obvious reason. Uh, the other problem was that I didn't want to call it a calculator. Um, OPTI can't really do what an in-company accounting team that has access to you know, utility spend, power use, uh, gas uh, flow meter consumption at the compressor, um, you know, inlet, things like this, right? We, we, we can't really do what um, you know, someone with in-house access um, you know, to the actuals at, a, at an operation would be able to do. What we can do is perhaps provide a, a consistently computed synoptic view across you know, large sets of projects. Um, from hopefully a, a, an accurate underlying engineering basis. And that's really been the goal. Uh, so we don't aim to necessarily calculate. We say, we're, we're not gonna tell you exactly what the emissions are, uh, but this is our best estimate given what we know about the project. Uh, lots of papers and, and uh, things published um, on the model. Um, it's really been in development since about 2010 or so. We're uh, undergoing a regulatory update for version 3.0, which is vastly improved and I'll, and I'll talk about that. Um, here's some, you know, potential papers. Feel free to email me if you're interested in understanding more about the model. Um, you know, just some real basics on what it is. It's basically a, a kind of a flow sheet like approach. So we have a set of uh, processes here. This is our well slash downhole pump process. Um, uh, streams flow in, streams flow out. And then on the process sheet, basically you're um, using uh, petroleum engineering fundamentals to compute what, in this case, the lifting work might be, right? Um, one way that it differs from something that's a, a sort of a more classical process simulation tool is that we sort of interface a lot with the life cycle world and with the methane emissions world and include a variety of kind of sources and approaches that aren't a typical kind of chemical engineering um, uh, kind of calculation. Although this basic sort of organizing principle around the flow sheet is very much like a, um, you know, a, a Aspen Hysis or another process simulator. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some recent improvements in the model, and then I'll finish up with, you know, kind of open questions. Um, these are all improvements for 3.0. One of the uh, pieces of feedback we were hearing over the last five years or so from industry 
was, uh, well, why don't you attempt to move away from kind of textbook correlations? A lot of our computations were based on, um, you know, basically treatments of different process units in engineering texts or uh, open scientific literature. Uh, what we did is uh, we moved instead to a process simulation platform. We used uh, Aspen Hysis. There are others as well, but these are, you know, a set, relatively small set of pretty typical process simulation tools used in industry. Uh, we were able to run thousands and tens of thousands of simulations, in this case of an acid gas removal unit, with various input conditions. Then we could generate essentially a predictive relationship to say, given properties of input streams, composition, uh, temperature, pressure, et cetera, um, what would this sophisticated process simulation software suggest the energy use would be uh, for pumps, um, uh, compression, uh, reboiler, uh, gas use, uh, et cetera, right? And so uh, what these are showing, these are parity charts showing the really good predictive relationship that we end up with, and this is for a holdout set that's essentially blinded from the training process. And so for sort of blind uh, test cases, we are often getting R squareds uh, in excess of 0.95. In um, some cases, 0.99. Our, our functions can essentially recreate with great fidelity what this uh, process simulation software um, would give you. And so we're steadily moving towards a set of modules based on these more fundamental or more uh, rigorous engineering methods rather than a textbook-like approach. A second important improvement, uh, my student Zhang Zhang has spent um, the last couple of years uh, working on remote sensing of oil and gas infrastructure. And so in this paper, we published the results of generating our first sort of global coverage database of where oil and gas projects are um, around the world. So this is a mixture of government data sources and um, well over 100 digitized uh, maps that she was able to sort of um, uh, combine into a consistent picture. So with this, we're able to basically provide some lookup uh, features with the model and say, okay, uh, give us the name of the operation. Well, essentially look up, do we have that name defined? And if so, uh, essentially go to the polygon represented by the field and, and access uh, some flaring information that's been provided for about the last decade or so from government satellites. Uh, some flaring estimates. So this is a really nice kind of detailed approach to that that we haven't been able to do before. And so that's exciting. Eventually as methane satellites, the methane remote sensing and methane comes on, uh, we'd like to integrate those kinds of approaches as well. Uh, the last one, we really have improved in, in recent years, the um, treatment of fugitive invented uh, methane emissions. Um, and so here, basically, this is just a, you know, sort of a summary slide of the approach developed by my student, Jeff Rutherford. What we were really trying to do is understand, can we, um, you know, from a, a kind of a valid and modern statistical approach, generate uh, fugitive emissions numbers in a tool like Opti that look like what we're seeing uh, from the literature um, using this uh, resampling approach uh, from fundamental measurements. And so you can see here on the left-hand side, um, our study, uh, agrees quite well with the uh, Alvarez et al. methane study in science in 2018, if it, any of you are familiar with that, um, which they found a large discrepancy with what EPA would expect. When we apply basically better statistical techniques um, than are used in, in sort of conventional inventories, we get something that looks a lot closer to what's seen out there empirically and in, in reality. And so that's a good sign. Uh, and so this has basically been integrated into the model. And so we're trying to basically converge the best of life cycle thinking and the best of, of methane science. Uh, hard at work on a new version, happy to talk in discussion about, about what that means. And we've, we've got a lot cooking there. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting questions ahead around you know, challenges uh, in generating reliable and consistent results around the world. It'd be great if we could sort of do global benchmarking in a way that we think is, is validated and, and fair. Um, and that would be a really useful toolkit uh, for industry. And so I, I've got a lot of questions about how to do that and would be happy to discuss it. Um, you know, a lot of, of standardized reporting met, um, sort of frameworks are being developed around the world and, you know, SEC recently, Right, announced um, uh, expectations for requirements of carbon reporting, et cetera. So how does this kind of tool align with governmental or super governmental uh, kinds of uh, reporting standards? And then I have big questions about how remote sensing might change this. So as we get into a world where methane and CO2 sensing is ubiquitous, how do we integrate those kinds of empirical observations with an inventory or sort of an accounting-like approach and make sure that we're 
they're squaring with each other? And that's a, that's a pretty big open question. I don't think anyone knows how to do that yet. Um, so that's just a quick uh, uh, summary of what we've been working on and happy to discuss more in, in Q&A. Cool, uh, thanks, Adam. So we'll uh, actually turn to mining next, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Jill Engelcox, who is director of the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis at uh, NREL. Uh, over her 30-year career, uh, she's been an engineer, researcher, program manager, strategic planner for a diverse suite of renewable energy, clean technology, and environmental programs uh, all over the world. And in the past decade, she has led uh, international strategic planning and technology assessments for re renewable energy and environmental sustainability research plans. So thanks, Jill. Great, thank you very much and, and super happy to be here um, to talk, to switch us a little bit from oil and gas uh, over to mining. Um, so I'm with the, uh, at NREL, uh, with the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis. And I wanna mention that specifically because that is a partnership between NREL and Stanford, as well as a few other uh, universities. And also want to acknowledge my colleague, Travis Lauder, who helped put together many of these slides and my colleague, TC Agogo, who also helped put together the report that some of these bases are on. So the, there's a couple of reports and I'll put a link in the chat uh, after I'm finished um, to specifically to that report on the left that we talk about clean energy and mining operations, and there's a lot more detail in that. We also have done quite a bit of work on oil, gas, oil and gas that I won't talk about, uh, but there's some interesting reports that definitely reflect a lot of the comments that have been made on oil and gas uh, so far. But in my presentation, I'm gonna focus on our um, work that we've been doing on mining. And so this really emerged from a realization that, um, that so many of the, uh, well, there's a strong link between mining and renewable energy. Um, all the renewable energy technologies that are being rapidly deployed, wind, solar, batteries, uh, depend very heavily on mined materials. Um, but then the mines themselves are facing uh, major issues around um, environment and social issues, decarbonization, and a license to operate uh, in the communities, in the rural areas and countries and communities that they operate in. So clean energy we view as a way to um, address uh, at least some of these challenges within the mining industry, which of course is uh, circular down around. It's very important to the renewable energy technologies that they would be that they would be using. So we have seen some uh, growth in renewable energy projects that are serving mining operations. In 2015, there was about 600 megawatts uh, serving different mine sites. Uh, and in 2020, there was over five gigawatts of renewable energy projects either installed or planned. Um, a lot of these are solar and some wind. Uh, and then, but recently there's been an increased focus on hybrid projects, which mix uh, traditional energy sources, uh, diesel, uh, natural gas, coal with uh, renewables. So operating in a hybrid fashion, uh, but certainly a long way to go to provide the uh, energy uh, for these sources, but we're seeing a uh, significant uptick in the installation of these projects. And in fact, um, at least two thirds of the largest mining and metals companies have set some kind of net zero emission targets. Uh, you will see most of these are in the 2050, 2040 range. So uh, not overly near term, but definitely uh, an interest from industry to begin to explore these. I will say my impression is that the mining industry is, is is behind the oil and gas industry in terms of starting to begin to think about these uh, technologies and how they might be applied to their operations, but uh, certainly starting to incorporate it into their, uh, into their targets. So thinking about what are the different technology, what type of energy loads and what type of technology solutions there might be. So the thing with the challenge with the mining industry is that the the mining uh, mines are very, very different from each other. So an underground uh, mine in, um, in the United States is very different than a, an open pit coal mine in Australia um, or a cobalt mine in, um, in Central Africa. So the, the, their energy demands and the energy types of, uh, that they use are very different. They do fall into these general categories. Uh, there's the exploration, extraction, and the related operations. So this is what you would typically think of as a mine. So it's, uh, it's drilling, it's digging, it's dewatering, um, 
within those within the mine site, either open pit or underground. There's the material handling where you're moving these materials from the mine uh, to wherever they will be processed, um, which can be conveyor belts or, or trucks, uh, trains, shuttle cars, other ops, um, transportation technologies. And then there's the um, beneficiation and processing where you're actually crushing, uh, separating, drying, and then ultimately refining. And this last step is where a tremendous amount of energy is used uh, in these products. In fact, um, this is mining is about 30, over 35% of the global industry energy use and some estimates up to 11% of our global energy use total. Uh, this is um, for mines that are particularly grid connected, electricity, they've, they have done quite a bit of electrification because it's, uh, it's a very efficient way to do it. There is concern about emissions, of course, air emissions, especially in underground mines. Uh, but even so, if it's electricity generated on site, it is often generated from fossil fuels. Um, and then, of course, offsite mines will be doing a combination of fuels and um, electricity combined. So a lot of diverse uh, sources, uh, both electricity and uh, process heat that are needed. So if we're looking at different clean energy applications in mining there, uh, I'm going to talk about briefly talk about these four. Uh, the from left to right, uh, going from a high technology readiness level, things being actually being deployed now to things that are uh, probably another decade out. And I'll start with renewable electricity loads. So we are seeing wind and solar, um, and in some cases storage being deployed um, at mine sites. They can offset the diesel fired electricity generation at the site. Uh, the big challenge, of course, is that wind and solar is variable and mine sites typically have consistent loads. So that's the graph on the top, the green line showing the, um, the load and the red line showing the wind production. So uh, dealing with that variability is one of the challenges. Um, you, and the chart on the right is looking at the levelized cost of energy as a function of renewable power and storage. And I, I, that's a very interesting paper if you have a chance to look at it. Because uh, it's looking at four different mine sites and, and the, the cost of like energy um, as a fun function of how much they generate from renewables. Uh, and the, the takeaway is that when you get over about 60 to 70 percent uh, uh, renewable power, it gets very, very expensive um, because you're trying to meet those peak demands. And we've actually, this is pretty consistent, what we found in all industry uh, sectors. Um, so you're going to need some long term energy storage or uh, dispatchable modular power systems to enable higher levels of renewable energy. So uh, some of these are available, but others we're really going to need these breakthrough technologies around hydrogen flow batteries. And uh, some people are talking about small modular nuclear reactors being deployed at some of these very large mine sites. The next um, technology that's, that we're starting to see go in is electrifying transport. Um, I mentioned this reduces both in greenhouse gas emissions, but also air emissions, which is very important in many of these sites, again, especially in underground sites. Um, elect, uh, battery transportation, electrified transportation can facilitate more renewables because you can actually integrate the electricity demand or possibly uh, have electrolyzers produce hydrogen, which then can be used in the vehicles. Picture there is a hydrogen fuel cell excavator prototype that has been developed by JCB. Um, many of this transport mobility has already been electrified, the conveyor belts, but um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done for lithium iron and hydrogen uh, vehicles for heavy off-road vehicles. Um, those have not been really fully developed, uh, but are starting to be tested at pilot scale. Moving up the TRL, green hydrogen. We already have had some discussions already about the challenges of green hydrogen and its cost. Uh, this would potentially be able to level out some of the, uh, the balance between the power production and the power demand. Um, and it could be used for electricity generation, for mobility, uh, process heat, um, or as a feedstock to some of the processing. Uh, as we've talked about before, the hydrogen prices and technology readiness are still major barriers for this being incorporated into mine sites as it is in elsewhere. And we're seeing mining companies starting to invest heavily in hydrogen, but if low cost green hydrogen is still expected to be at least a decade uh, out from full commercial uh, scale. And then finally, process heat and feedstocks. So um, there are some low and no carbon thermal technologies. This is concentrating solar. 
uh, but they have not really been commercially demonstrated at a mining scale. Um, and there's a number of things, challenges around that, uh, around land use and um, the technology and the cost and other elements, which I'm happy to chat about later. Um, this electrification of process heat uh, can be a pathway to incorporating more renewable generation, but we really need to get these technologies to uh, be able to produce at the temperatures and the scale that's necessary. Um, and then also, you know, this also feeds into feedstocks and fuels. Uh, we pre um, had already discussed earlier about you need um, different types of hydrogen reduction of iron ore and other uh, elements on the, uh, the, the pro mineral processing side. Um, I do have a small modular reactor here mentioned. I won't discuss that in great depth, but that is uh, a, a technology that's being discussed for, for the future um, as potentially being deployable in a scale that would work for large mines. And, uh, it, but that also is uh, just in early stages of being planning for demonstration uh, for electricity generation and some industrial processes. So we're still probably uh, at least at least five years and probably 10 years out from, from those technologies. Uh, so just wrapping up, I want to really emphasize that renewable energy technologies need mined materials. And so we think it's really important that mining operations benefit from using renewable energy because the two are very tightly linked. Um, there are a number of barriers. Um, I've mentioned some of them in terms of the technology not being ready. I want to also mention that sometimes there's conflicting business models. Uh, renewable energy developers require 20-year PP power purchase agreements. Uh, mine operators don't always operate at consistent energy demand from year to year. Uh, and so there's not a, a good um, match up there. Uh, there's a, not a lot of renewable energy expertise that's been integrated into their mining models and decision making. And despite mines having a lot of land, a lot of it is not suitable for some renewable energy technologies. And then there's, but there's a number of enablers. There's, um, we're starting to see, we need to align the incentives and contract structures, uh, design mine sites, energy management to make the loads more flexible as, um, as well as the production, uh, capacity building within the industry, uh, lots of technology development and research and development needed to demonstrate these technologies. Interesting uh, thinking about supply chain certification, a lot of uh, end use of renewable energy and other technologies are interested in green minerals and metals. And so they want certification that these are being produced in an environmental and, and uh, way, sustainable way. Policy and regulation measures, And then finally, um, as was mentioned several times already, collaboration between the renewable energy sector and um, the mining sector is going to be really important. So thank you very much and looking forward to our discussion. Uh, thanks, Jill. So I will uh, introduce now uh, Amit Singh, who is the Global Head of Strategy and Marketing, uh, and he's based in London. This is a position he assumed in June 2021. In this role, he's responsible for corporate strategy, uh, mergers and acquisitions, strategic partnerships, venture capital, and marketing to maximize uh, customer value generation for the digital integrated projects and energy transition division of uh, Schlumberger. So uh, thank you, Amit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, and good morning and good afternoon. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm based out of London, but uh, coincidentally, I'm dialing in today from uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I have to fly in here for a few meetings. Uh, but um, and also thank you for the invitation and uh, participating in a very interesting panel here today. I think you know I, I'll take some time to maybe share some of the some of your perspectives and also maybe um, um, what I'm seeing here is a very interesting trend because a lot of topics which have been talked about from my predecessors are very really much common and I think they drive our focus as well and for our customers. So um, you know, getting started, I think the the, the kind of uh, convergence of some of the trends um, around climate, around the oil price, and the progression and maturity of digital technology means that, you know, the way we are going to develop our oil and gas industry going forward doesn't have to be the same way we've done before. And in, in some ways, um, you know, I think we believe that energy transition is going to be an era of energy digitalization as well. And I think you know, and I saw a lot of the talk here today has already highlighted that, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But really, uh, I think some of the technologies which are already available in our hands can be put to use to really transform the way we work 
and also then lead into you know due to footprint avoidance and, and remediation and reduction at scale. So really the opportunity is to take advantage of these technologies and, and, and put together a solution which can drive those results. Uh, what we're doing in Slumberge is, you know, uh, first of all, in, in terms of uh, packaging and innovating our technology um, r and &E portfolio on what we're calling it as transition technology. And we are focusing on, you know, a broad range of topics, but here I've highlighted six topics which we are really focusing on. The first one is around addressing methane emissions, end-to-end -end, uh, understanding and analyzing uh, fugitive methane emissions. Um, nailing it down um, to understand where it might be coming from. Also, uh, making sure we invest in technologies from walls and other places to, um, you know, replace and remediate as quickly as possible. Uh, we are investing in, um, you know, simulation technologies, um, software simulation technologies to understand if we can pinpoint through sensors where exactly it is coming from at the shortest and cheapest, um, so that uh, it, it can be embraced and adopted by our customers. I think flaring has been talked about a lot. Uh, there is a lot of maturity in eliminating flaring in many places in geographies, uh, but uh, in some of the early stages of production, it has been very difficult. Um, so we are working very hard with our very testing product line and services to see how we could potentially capture some of that uh, uh, flow back uh, and also potentially capture and, and, and uh, remediate the flare itself completely uh, out of the system. Um, we are also working very hard on developing technologies and techniques to reduce our CO2 footprint in uh, well construction process um, and well completion process. Um, so essentially, um, it starts from not just scope one and two, but also scope three, looking at our supply chain as well. And we are, we are putting in systems in the first place to bring visibility to the CO2 footprint itself, but then later on also give options and technologies which can reduce and remediate, um, you know, carbon footprint as well by essentially changing the well design, changing the way we, um, you know, uh, select the PHA, and giving a full control to the uh, planner of the well to design the well not just on the net pay maximization or cost reduction, but also design the well based on what will reduce the CO2 footprint. Um, and we are taking that a step further in working on digital technologies to develop a full field uh, scalable planning tool, which will allow our customers to you know, look at full subsurface um, modeling to some of the famous simulators I'm sure you're aware of, um, whether it's Intersect or Eclipse and Total, model the entire subsurface chain and simulate the future forecast uh, and, and production, but also um, you know, give a prediction of what the CO2 footprint might look like and what are the different CO2 footprints for different scenarios of development or redevelopment plan which the companies might undertake. So some of these technologies will allow um, companies to make more informed decisions uh, about uh, FDP and uh, also potentially avoid a lot of uh, CO2 footprint uh, as well. Um, one topic which I think has been talked about already is electrification. I think um, you know this is especially true for production systems portfolio of uh, Shlumberger. And um, if you look at some of the offshore platforms where we still have hydraulic um, actuators, I think we, we feel uh, electrifying them will not only um, bring obviously lower CO2 footprint, but also through condition-based monitoring and digital technologies, we can fully automate uh, some of these platforms and not only reduce because of the reduction of CO2 use, but also because there will be less human uh, intervention required, which will also reduce greatly the CO2 footprint of the entire value chain. And lastly, I think there is a lot of focus um, on CO2 um, capture and uh, storage. Um, again, I think um, CPUS projects will have to scale up in the next few years, and they're already scaling up. We are kind of seeing a massive uptick in activity globally. And uh, it needs to be simplified and cost of CO2 storage is still pretty high. And uh, the risk with injectivity and containment has to be managed. So we are, we are, we are investing on, um, you know, at all capture, transport and storage surveillance to reduce the cost of CPUS and also work with our um, companies uh, and partners to assist in their, um, you know, CPUS projects as well. 
Um, I just wanted to maybe give you an example of what some of these you know, technologies, when we put to use, what does it really mean, right? And I think this is a project, um, uh, in, it's an integrated project which um, is a, we're managing in uh, Ecuador, where we have deployed an ESP monitoring and ESP surveillance system, where, you know, it's a fully autonomous system, uh, which was deployed. And um, it has reduced field visits by 60%, and production losses have also dropped by 40%. But the real impact, was around you know you know driving trips which were needed by our customers have completely eliminated uh, been eliminated and this is an example where uh, you know we had high GOR wells where you know very occasionally you had to release the pressure and vent it and somebody was doing it manually so through these systems which are fully uh, on electricity and renewable energy we have deployed these edge compute uh, technologies which do it autonomously without human intervention. So really, I think, um, you know, uh, we want, I wanted to just illustrate an example here of how digital can, and, and, and combined with electrification, can completely eliminate a lot of CO2 footprint, which is basically um, unnecessary trips, which uh, our uh, field organization has to take sometimes in the field. Um, and there are many examples like this, which uh, you know, we are working with our customers globally to deploy. Um, you know, methane emissions have been talked about a lot. And I think uh, this is a topic which has a very strong short-term impact if we get this right. Um, and and I, I heard one of the gentlemen talk about the project Astra where we're also involved. Um, and what we're doing is really bringing a gamut of all the technologies we have in our portfolio to really give an end-to-end -end, uh, understanding of uh, methane emissions and, and where the potential limitation can come from. Um, so it's it's again uh, we feel um, it's it's really um, going to change the way um, the fields are managed, the production is managed, um, and, um, and I think we've also invested in uh, satellite companies via TSAT and working uh, with them in a very collaborative fashion to see how we can further improve some of the footprints of uh, methane emissions which are being detected by satellite uh, companies today. And we will make that available to our customers um, globally to, to rescale and decarbonize uh, their uh, operations. Um, talking about CCUS, I think CCUS is, is absolutely going to be a key way to, um, to, to reduce carbon footprint in the short term. So we need to really work together to reduce the cost of CCUS and make it more easy, um, especially for industries which are not familiar with oil and gas, um, you know, the industrial space. So cementing and steel and um, they're also looking to uh, decarbonize so we are investing a lot in, in technologies to reduce the total co2 uh, storage cost and capture cost uh, and building services which can allow our customers to uh, do it more efficiently in fact this is an example we just pulled out from the northern lights project which we were recently awarded uh, to do a full uh, site characterization and field study uh, as well so um, in fact, uh, I think it's fair to say that in just two years, our team is three times more busy than, than, than two years ago. So the uptake in CCUS projects is quite quite real globally. Um, and, and I think um, it's, uh, it's, it's fair to say that every meeting we are having, every, every customer we are meeting these days, including here in Saudi Arabia, is, uh, has got some element of uh, CCUS uh, in the agenda. So CCUS is a topic which is, uh, I think, gaining a lot of momentum and a lot of um, uh, attention in the short term. And I think um, as an industry, we need to find ways to reduce the cost and make it more accessible for, for everybody. Um, I think with that, I'll conclude uh, saying that uh, you know, the, the way to do it, uh, we have to really take advantage of the macros today we are in, uh, take advantage of uh, the technologies we have in our hands and really deploy at scale and accelerate digital transformation. Uh, which will, I think, drive decarbonization, but also start making those choices in, um, in, in using technologies and design choices which will eliminate and reduce uh, CO2 footprint uh, for our operation. Um, with that, I'll hand it back. Uh, thank you. Cool. Uh, thanks. You know, Amit, you had to wait longest to speak, so maybe we'll, we'll start with the first question for you. Um, you know, here at the end, I, th I think you were describing a little bit, you know, the, the tension between 
carbon capture and storage and uh, electrification, at least, you know, in some people's mind, there's a, there's a tension there. So, you know, how does Schlumberger kind of see itself, you know, creating value and assisting in decarbonization? Um, is it one or the other, or is it both, or you know, how are you going to sort out what the customer yeah. wants versus what the world needs? Yeah, I, I think I think there is space for both. I think uh, there is space for both. I think if you look at quantifying, um, you know, CO two reduction, uh, it's going to happen if we apply both. But in the in really, we feel again we sit in with the benefit of looking at all the you know. We have access to all the technology within our portfolio and uh, in our um, collaborative uh, partners. So we feel that the problem is not technology. Sometimes the problem is integration of technology, how you bring it all together, and you bring it together in such a way that it is not cost prohibitive. So really, I think the challenge is, can you do that? So digital opens that avenue. And electrification is really going to make it easy because you now you can drive edge uh, devices, IoT devices, uh, especially on platforms. Um, you know, we're also looking at some of the frack fleets. If we can drive electrification there to again reduce our footprint, but really the big scale difference is going to come in the short term from digitalization of our industry. So we're really investing a lot of uh, our time and effort in uh, prioritizing R and E projects in that space. And what we would like to call as uh, digitally enabled services, um, so that um, you know we're looking at human-less uh, intervention. I mean, uh, the famous wireline, which uh, I think you probably are known for, uh, we're looking at making it autonomous inter intervention to wireline. Uh, we have started drilling autonomous wells, uh, where um, you know you eliminate uh, people on the rig pretty much, and we have drilled actually quite a bit. The example I showed you in Ecuador, we have drilled 70,000 feet in autonomous operations with uh, completely no human um, in command on the drill chair. Um, and we feel that the technologies in that space are going to continue to grow. And the design choices and drilling choices and we can make because of the combination of electrification and digital means you can have very long wells, you can have um, different uh, you know, development plans, and humanless as well. So the avoidance of CO2 in upstream can be magnified with that. And that's really our, our focus area at the moment. And Anthony, going back to your, if I interject, uh, going back to your question of uh, electrification or carbon capture or both, I, I mean, it, it almost, there's also going to be op opportunities for both together. Um, if you look at the direction of uh, the LNG industry recently, you know, you'll see all, all electric LNG facilities now being built. And when you when you put those in the U.S., you you can grid tie those into renewable energy and and uh, and, and tie that straight electrification all the way through. You know, when you when you take those overseas, as I was talking about earlier, remote op, remote operating environment, you may couple that up with a blue power plant, whether it's uh, you know natural gas power with carbon capture sequestration or hydrogen combustion. With uh, with carbon capture sequestration, so it's it, it's definitely going to be all of the above um, when it comes to these solutions. Absolutely. Yeah. The reason I, I sort of posed it that way because it it you know it, you talk to your average citizen of the world, right? And they tend to think the solution is X. They don't realize that the solution is X, Y, Z, and some other stuff, right? Right. That's yet to be innovated. Um, Adam, I wanted to, to turn to you for a moment. You. Your presentation generated a lot of questions in the chat, which is phenomenal. That kind of a you know the idea uh, here, and my my question for you is: Would uh, global transparency, you know, on reporting standards, you know, and publicly available data, and be able to look at things in sort of near real time, would it, you know, propel us to smaller net emissions? Um, crazy I idea. think so. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think what we're seeing, for example, in the um, in the methane sphere, which is a little, you know a little bit different, a part of my of my research agenda that I didn't talk too much about today. But there's a lot of stuff that happens that is, um, you know, poorly understood, happening at real, remote locations. You know, not well measured and monitored, and so I think. You know, there's just some some value in and virtue in in kind of uh, discipline required 
uh, to meet reporting standards, right? And so I think there's just just starting to track things, you know, inherently, um, you know, may highlight some issues, right? That you just you just don't realize are going on, right? So I think there's some value there um, across all the emission sources, uh, like that Bob laid out. Not just fugitives, but fugitives is the example where it's very clear that. Uh, for example, we've been working a lot with airplane teams that fly over. They'll notice something reported to the company, and then the company will say, oh, wow, okay, we didn't realize that was happening. They'll fix it, and then often they can go back through their, you know, SCADA outputs or, you know, whatever kind of monitoring they have. Oh, okay, that's where the issue happened. We didn't realize that that was, that that was going on, right? And so that's an obvious example from fugitives, but I think... Um, you know, other sources as well. I think just the act of doing this, this, uh, you know, accounting and, and monitoring is, is useful. I mean, I think, um, you know, re reporting standards coupled to incentives are obviously going to be stronger. So if, for example, you have regions where you, you just report versus regions where you report and are, for example, you know, subject to a levy based on, you know, maybe a revenue, revenue neutral levy or something based on your carbon intensity, uh, you know, that strikes me as a more powerful combination, but I think there is there is benefit just from knowing better what's happening, right? Um, there's value there. And does anybody on our panel have any, any thoughts on that? You know, global transparency on data and how just openness can propel change? Well, certainly I'd add the, the you know, the, the greatest opportunity as I, as I mentioned several, as I've mentioned is, is in that methane space. Uh, under understanding um, those uh, intermittent emission, uh, emission sources and and being able to mitigate those, I, I think the I think the, the the rest of the challenges is is well enough understood that, that I think we have a, a very solid understanding of what needs to be done done to decarbonize the industry and methane with those intermittent emissions and obviously the the magnification of the impact of those um, with its uh, with its um, effective uh, GHG. Um, uh, uh, footprint is, is important to understand and, and got a lot of research going on there. Yeah, and I'll just add real briefly here that we're seeing a lot of interest, uh, you know, for technologies that are build them build themselves as green uh, or environmental, they want to know where their minerals come from. And so the we don't have that transparency yet in terms fully, it's because it's a full commodities market, but how they're processed, how they come through the supply chain, how they end up uh, ultimately into your, you know, your iPhone or your solar panel or whatever you're developing. I think if there was more transparency and we had better information, I think we would see companies from the end use product side really pushing that from the industry side to uh, to want to be able to say our our iPhone has 100% sustainably mined minerals and these types of things. So I, I think, but we don't have that transparency fully yet to, all the way back to the raw material stage. Yeah, I'd really like to know where my cobalt comes from. You know, I, yeah, or you probably wouldn't. Central I, Africa, I, yeah, or, you, or you'd rather not know. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I'd really, well, it's a long, yeah, I'd like to not have it. If I can, Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna shoot in the uh, it's interesting discussion uh, just from a completely different perspective and coming from a background of carbon storage where we really struggled with uh, public trust um everywhere in around the world europe especially uh is that transparency uh from the software side uh data um and northern lights i think was mentioned right that the northern lights and equinor has published all of the data uh from the uh from the co2 storage well uh, that's there for anybody to take and look at we uh work on co2 storage open source simulation uh, that's there for anybody to dig in and there's no secrets we're not uh, you know we really think it's important that uh, we show what we're doing to the public they've invested enormous amounts of money northern lights another one uh, public in investments so it's it really uh, behooves us to put everything we can out there of course there are some things that uh, we, we don't always publish but uh, open source open data open community is a is a driving force from co2 storage and there's a lot to learn there too one, one thing I'd note is that over the, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, and a lot of times there's a fair amount of sensitivity from operators about some of these data, because some of these data may provide or are viewed to provide insights into the efficiency of an operation, how the, uh, how the field is performing, is it watering out, all these kinds of things, right? So the kinds of things we, we want to know 
to estimate what the intensity is going to be for pump work or separation work or whatever are kinds of things that operators have tended to be once we have detailed discussions about this is what we'd want it 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 it, it gets a little shy at this point so for example we've been collaborating for a long time with aramco and have really great relationships and, and funding and partnerships and data sharing with our strategy and policy side, strategy, technology, and policy side. But the production side of Aramco is kind of walled off and won't even share data within the company, right? Because the other segments of the company, that's viewed very much as a, essentially a kind of a crown secret or the, you know, the, the, the resources there are viewed very much as the sort of the natural, you know, the national, um, uh, you know, sort of um, gold mine, so to speak, I guess. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity about about sharing those kinds of data, even to people who who nominally work for uh, for Ramco, for example, in another capacity, right? And so that has tended to be, you know, a little hard. And I think Norway, you know, Sarah, hats off to you guys. We've used Norwegian data for a long time, and uh, incredible transparency. That's tended to be a little harder of a sell elsewhere in the world. I, I wish it weren't, but it, but it is. Right. For, I think sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for, you know, not necessarily, but, you know, that's what we've seen. So we're, we're yeah, getting... I think if I can add sure. just two, two imperatives, I mean, um, I would say that um, to the topic of, you know, operators having a hard time sharing, I think it's changing. I've started to see change uh, in the last, uh, I would say, dare to say six months, one year. Um, I think uh, there is a little bit more openness to sharing, um, including some of the names I've just heard on the call. I think I can vouch for that. And, and two, I think uh, there is a drive from many of the investors, uh, SEC um, as well, Wall Street, and many of the you know, stock exchanges are going to make uh, green line reporting mandatory. And I think that is going to become part of the ESG um, as well. So I think. That is going to drive a lot of open behavior. And third, when it comes to scope three, if you don't have transparent sharing of data with your suppliers and your customers, there's no scope three uh, at all. Uh, it doesn't exist uh, in real world. So I think um, many of the companies are really investing a lot on carbon accounting um, and accreditation and uh, looking to collaborate on those projects, including us uh, as well. Uh, so I think. Uh, uh, absolutely an area which will develop and will be key to drive decarbonization in the years to come. Yeah. So I want to, we have a, a, just a few minutes left. I wanted to turn it to the, uh, to the audience. And uh, there, there was actually an interesting comment from uh, Mark Neckabom that sort of, or Neckadom, sorry, I messed up your name, uh, uh, about uh, antitrust laws that might constrain, you know, ability to share uh, information. Uh, even when we want to. So um, I don't know, Mark, do you want to expand on that? I, and uh, we can get a comment from our panel. Well, I could very briefly, and thanks, Anthony, and, and the whole panel. It's just been very fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I come from a, a long career in government as a regulator and uh, a professional bureaucrat, uh, but I'm now with the Western States Petroleum Association, which is a uh, uh, we represent uh, many of the large, uh, many of the people here, Exxon Mobil, Shell, and others. And we've had a great deal of discussion in the ESG space, uh, and particularly how to educate many of the state governments that are working on policies that will have a profound effect on the ability of the industry to do many of the things that we're talking about this morning. And so um, as we are trying to prepare briefings and comment letters to many of our regulatory agencies, we run into antitrust laws uh, where there are things that we would love to be able to share, uh, information like cost structure on CCS and, and that sort of thing. We, we'd really love to be able to roll this kind of stuff out, but our antitrust laws, uh, for very good reasons, uh, prevent us from doing so. And so it's, it's an interesting challenge because many of the regulators and the decision makers who are making truly profound uh, and, and long-term affecting uh, decisions uh, really don't know enough. In fact, I, I, I wish there were about two dozen legislators and board members at the Air Resources Board who were listening to this discussion because this is terribly important work and our ability to share that information is highly constrained by law. Thanks. 
I don't know, are there other uh, questions in the audience that we didn't address? Okay, well, I think we're nearly at the end of time. Is that correct, Richard? I have about five more minutes. Uh, oh, we have five more minutes, uh, awesome. Yep. Cool, so then I, my, the, the biggest question that I developed here that I have to ask, it's a little off topic, it goes to Jill. You know, if you bring a small uh, modular reactor, you know, to a, a, a mine site, I mean, while the risk might be very small that there is an accident, do you run the, you know, I mean, have people thought about what the risks are of, you know, basically, you know, poisoning, you know, uh, a valuable resource? Um, because you had some some little problem, and how are how are people thinking about addressing that? Yeah, um, I'll try to address that the best I can. Um, the way the small modular reactors are being designed are is intended to be um, containerized in a sense that they're easily transportable on, say, a train car. Um, so something of that size or smaller. There are some that are even being designed. You know, so these are fifty megawatts sort of. Um, um, size up to 300. Um, and they're designed to be inherently safe so that if there is a loss of power or other aspect to them, they just, they naturally shut themselves down and then they, there's not all the cooling elements and all the other aspects of them. Um, so they're, the, they're designed to be this transportable set them up, plug them in and then operate and then be able to take the entire thing away again at the end of, you know, when it either needs refueling or at the end of its life. And it also, the refueling times are much, much longer. They're multiple years as opposed to, you know, a, a every year, or every two years, like a large scale power plant. Um, so that's the, that's the intention of these. And the, the intention is also to, to be able to mass manufacture them so that you could put, you could modularize, you could do one, two, three, depending on your power demand, you could take one away, you could, you could have one shut down. So, um, so in theory, there should not, the, the risk of a, of an accident should be very, very low. Um, obviously most of these mine sites could potentially be in remote locations. You would partially bury these, um, for security, um, and also other sorts of safety reasons. So, uh, but I'm going to caveat this by saying they haven't been demonstrated yet. They, there's only been a couple designs that are far enough along in the process to being, um, in the regulatory process to being moving to the demonstration phase. Those won't be finished for another five years. Um, but that said, they are a potentially a, a source of combined heat and power that um, could be very consistent and used and scaled to a size that would fit. Um, I think it just remains to be seen about whether the designs can meet all these criteria um, that they're being, that they're targeting. Um, if they do, they might be potentially very useful. Um, but I don't know if we're going to meet it in a cost-effective, timely manner in the next immediate time frame. Yeah, th this is a really interesting idea to me. I, 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 you know, I thought of this as Sarah was bringing up grid tide um, and renewably integrated oil and gas operations. One of the challenges with those, and we we worked on a paper on this, is, you know, it's not clear to me what the economics are of switching on and off a very valuable resource. Right, reducing the intensity with which you can use that capital. You've invested, a, let's say, a billion dollars in an offshore platform. You're really incentivized. We, we went to an offshore platform once in a helicopter, and, and I can't remember what he said. It was something like every hour they were down, they hemorrhaged fifty thousand dollars, or you know, something like this, right? Which is sounds like a lot to me, right? <laughs> so, I mean, maybe you know, maybe it isn't, but um, so you know, the, the small modular reactor idea, right? It's it's carbon free. It's continuous, you know, for years at a time. That really that seems to me to mesh very well with the industrial, you know, keeping your uptime up on your capital, um, you know, in a way that it's just it, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe you need a couple of renewables to batteries, but the the small modular reactor has that seemingly inherent advantage. Yeah, and people are looking to combine it. There are some tests going on to look at green hydrogen. So you're when you have when you don't need the electricity demand from the reactor, you're producing hydrogen. Which, if you combine it with say a vehicle vehicle production or vehicle transportation use, process heat use, other things, um, or just storage, just storing the hydrogen. If you don't want to cycle your reactor down, people are looking. People are doing some. Analysis and some demonstration for that for large reactors. In theory, it could be used for the small reactors if you if you had a mine site that or an industrial site that had a scale down in demand. Um, 
So lots of analysis going on to see what cost points would have to be hit in order for this to be even cost effective. Yeah, I think it, it's it's exciting to think about those possibilities. It'd be kind of cool to see it come in as a you know cost effective and completely safe uh, technology. Hey, you know there was one question that that uh, in scanning back, I I see that we didn't address, uh, and this was a question about uh, in situ generation of uh, hydrogen, uh, and if you know that was um, you know a possibility. So I can actually read the question. Are there technologies worth pursuing for the cracking of oil and gas in the subsurface to uh, produce hydrogen? I'll just jump in. I mean, uh, not, not that I know of, and certainly not any kind of TRL, but there is some um, small things going on in, in uh, subsurface bioreactors. So using microbes uh, to generate hydrogen, uh, let's say from depleted oil and gas reservoirs, uh, it's a very, we talk about low TRL, this is at the bottom of the barrel TRL, but it's certainly microbes can do this, you know, and it's controlling the process, uh, but you get kind of an all in one package uh, <laughs> of a hydrogen store uh, made for you by, by the, but controlling microbes, understanding them, uh, you know, not having other microbes come along and eat up the hydrogen that the ones have generated. I mean, this is a, certainly a, a very, but the, you know, these are the pie in the sky, blue sky things that, that we need to really think about uh, because there's not one silver bullet here and uh, everything should be on the table. So there's some, some things going on, but uh, certainly not at a high TRL for sure. Low TRL is where the fun is and where the long-term money is. So that's how you get rich. And we can sell it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> so, or, or that's how you work on a startup for five years and then fail and <laughs> don't get rich. One of the two. Well, and then you start another startup. That's right. Yeah, I think the key, you know, in this 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 question, if it was going to be done, I, I assume this this by the way it says cracking that you know it's going to be a temperature process. Mm -hmm. the key would be somehow to reject the carbon in a way that it's not gaseous. Um, because otherwise you're going to fill up your reservoir with products mm -hmm. that you're not that interested in. Uh, cool. So we are nearly uh, at the end of our time. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to, you know, if there's anything that was said that you wanted to, you know, make a comment on and didn't have a chance. I'll give people the opportunity for that. Well, seeing no one, I will thank our, uh, our panelists today for uh, joining us from across the world and managing time zones, which is, uh, you know, never easy, uh, especially when you're, you know, coming to the West Coast of the U.S., which always seems like it's out of, you know, far out of sync with uh, other parts of the world. Uh, and, you know, I'll sum up by saying, you know, I, I think, you know, the message that we kind of got today is that there's, there's really a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of technology that's available and, you know, deployable across, um, you know, reasonable timeframes to, to, to really sort of, you know, help, you know, the world meet its ambition to transition to lower carbon uh, technologies. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Richard.